you're such a role model for so many people and adored by the vegan community. Com yeah, vegan community. Um, how did your journey with veganism start out? First of you, first of all, um, thank you so much. That's one of the nicest things that anybody's ever said to me. So that's really sweet. Um, my journey with veganism started probably when I was about four years old, actually. Um, when I was, my father is a professional fisherman. He always has been. I was on his boat and um, he was fishing with my mother. And I caught my first fish. And when I pulled the fish up onto the boat and watched the fish flop back and forth and back and forth and um, slowly die, I felt terrible. And my parents were excited and I was very, very upset. And from that moment on, I couldn't eat or smell fish without getting very sick to my stomach. I actually would vomit if I mm -hmm. had to eat fish and my parents told me it was my favorite food before then. And so for the rest of my life, I never ate fish. And even today, I can't eat seaweed or anything that smells like really? sea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I didn't know when I was a child, I didn't realize what my reaction was. I just became disgusted. I felt very sad, and I became disgusted. And so it wasn't until I actually became vegetarian at 23 um, in 1989, and then vegan a few years later, that I realized that that was actually my first experience becoming vegan, and what was the beginning of my journey to veganism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when did you become vegan? I became vegetarian in 1989, and vegan several years, I'm not sure exactly when after that. Um, and I became vegetarian after I got sick having eaten a hamburger that had been contaminated with Campylobacter, which is a mm -hmm. foodborne bacteria similar to Salmonella. I wasn't planning on becoming a vegetarian at the time, but before that I'd always sort of felt like a, a vegetarian trapped in a meat eater's body because I cared about animals, I knew vegetarianism was more in alignment with my own value system. I didn't have any understanding of veganism at the time because many people weren't aware of veganism at mm -hmm. the time. Um, but I became disgusted by meat after I ate this hamburger and I stopped eating meat and eggs and then I um, I became vegetarian I learned about animal agriculture I realized that I did not want to be a part of that process in any way shape or form I started teaching about it and then I learned about dairy and I stopped eating dairy products and became vegan in my 20s and I'm 46 now so it was a long time ago okay um, how important is it for you to be a voice in helping people uh, discover a more compassionate life it's with, uh, the most important thing in my life. Um, I mean, the most important thing in my life is really trying to live my truth, and that's a fundamental part of what's true for me. It's what makes me want to get up in the morning. It's what keeps me feeling excited about being alive. Um, and feeling like, I don't remember who said this, some activist, I think it might have been Alice Walker, actually, the writer, who said, activism is the price, activism is the rent I pay for living on this planet. And I feel the same way. That's a cool quote. <laughs> um, so that means you have some kind of values inside. What what motivates you to do? What this? inspires me? What motivates me? Yeah. Um, you do. I mean, all the <laughs> vegans, the wonderful vegans that I meet, and activists, and and people who I meet that are so compassionate and working so hard to make the world a better place, just f inspire me to want to be doing the same and want to be doing more of the same and. I want to be supporting people who are doing the important work in the world and cultivating in people in this world their natural emotions and qualities like empathy and compassion and um, you know and a natural desire that so many of us have for justice. It, it makes me feel good and it's those are the seeds in myself that I want to keep watering as well. There's a Buddhist quote that I always refer to when I'm speaking which is goes something like this, that we all have within us the seeds of greed, hatred, and desire, and we also have within us the seeds of love, compassion, and empathy. And our job is just to water the right seeds. And the seeds we water in ourselves, we water in others, and vice versa. And so I try to stay mindful and be conscious of watering those seeds. Wow. <laughs> um, how can you give people insights about uh, how animals are treated and the veganism when, you, when they already know you well? Like friends and family, they know what you do, they know your story, but mm -hmm. they're still not living up to what you think is good for the world. <laughs> well, people will only be receptive to insights and information when they're ready to be. 
And so sometimes the hardest people to advocate to are our friends and family members. They're the people we're closest to. Often vegans struggle with family members around their veganism, and, and sometimes this is because it has less to do with the veganism per se, and, and more to do with power issues and other family dynamics that get expressed through veganism. Um, I think it's just really important to never be trying to convert people, and for vegans to not to feel that it's our obligation to always be advocating and trying to change people. Because we can't change people. All we can do is live our truth. My friend um, and another American author, Colleen Patrick Boudreau, always says that our goal has to be to plant seeds. All we can do is plant seeds. And um, it takes a burden off of vegans for feeling like we have to keep teaching people about veganism. Teaching new people that we haven't met before by sharing our stories, that's fine. But when people know, our friends and family, they know we're vegan, if they know why we're vegan, and they're still choosing not to be vegan, then they're probably just not ready to be vegan. Mm -hmm. We can't make people change. We can't make them ready to change. All we can do is live our lives according to the values that are most important to us and model what we're asking for in others mm -hmm. in those situations. I mean, there are plenty of situations where we can actively advocate, but in family situations, it's often different. Mm -hmm. Well, l last time I had someone over from America, a guy, and I showed him your book, and he said, well, I wouldn't mind um, eating a dog, wearing a pig, or loving a cow. What would you say to him? <laughs> uh, what would I say to him? Um, you know, I think what you're asking is when people, if I understand, when people seem like they really are not concerned about yeah. harming animals, mm -hmm. is that what you're getting yeah. at, you know, people who demonstrate that they seem like they don't really have empathy, say, okay, well, now I'll eat all animals instead of eating no animals. Mm -hmm. You know, most people do have empathy for animals, and most people really are just defended, and their empathy is just buried under their carnistic defenses, as I talk about in my book and in my other writing. Um, some people don't have empathy. They're a small percentage of the population, um, and never will. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know, as, as vegans, we have to be um, selective in terms of where we're going to spend our energy, who we're going to advocate to. And there are many, many people in the world who are open to and receptive to our message. And those are the people that we need to be sharing our message with. People who are very defended are probably not a good use of our time and our energy. Mm -hmm. You sound like me. <laughs> um, in Holland, we have the Dutch Party for the Animals. You've heard of it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Do you think uh, America can, will be able to achieve such a change anytime soon? I hope so. Holland is a model for us. I mean, that really says something about the consciousness here. And it's really, really impressive and it really inspires me. Um, and I really do hope that um, the Netherlands will be a model for the rest of the world in this way. Mm -hmm. And I believe they will, and that's the direction that we're moving in. That's the direction the vegan movement is moving in, the animal rights movement is moving in. It's, it's growing in power and size and scope, and consciousness is changing quite quickly in many places in the world when it comes to our relationships with other animals. Yeah, so you believe in a vegan future? Absolutely. I see it all the time. Um, I, I have, I'm in a very privileged position. I have the opportunity to travel around the world speaking about feeding animals, and I get to interact with thousands of people, meat eaters and vegans, vegetarians from all different cultures, and the story that I hear over and over again is the same. The story is that people care about animals, and they don't want them to suffer. People care about the truth, and they want to do less harm, and most people want to live more authentic lives, and just need to be reached in a certain way. And I see the vegan movement growing everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really inspired by it. Um, in Holland, we also have some animal welfare organizations who promote like organic meat and dairy products. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Well, in the United States, we do too, and we refer to them as um, humane meat or you know dairy mm -hmm. or egg products and. You know, I think it's a, I wrote an article about this called Understanding Neocarnism, and, um, and it's about new carnisms, new forms of carnism that have emerged now that vegan activists and the internet, with the help of the internet, have um, 
sufficiently, in my opinion, destabilized denial or invisibility, which is the primary defense of carnism. Many people today can no longer deny at least the most egregious practices of agribusiness. And they don't want to cause animals harm. And so the way agribusiness, animal agribusiness, has responded has been by promoting these, um, you know, bizarre forms of animal products which are supposedly humane or happy or, you know, humanely produced. It's a, it's a PR, in my opinion, it's, you know, many people's opinions, it's a PR move. Um, but it's a good sign. It demonstrates what I've been saying, what we know, that people want to do less harm to animals. Um, as vegans, we need to just keep pushing back and keep, you know, holding the spotlight on these issues and making it very clear that killing somebody is not doing less harm or no harm to them. Killing is harming. Mm -hmm. Taking somebody's life, somebody who has a life that they desperately want to hold on to, is never a harmless act. Mm -hmm. But then most people say, well, it's only for a few seconds. Well, they have a good life and they suffer for, for a few seconds and then so for so. What's well, most, the problem? <laughs> right, you're right. They, that is a very common response. And, you know, most people, however, would not advocate the same thing being done to a golden retriever or a Labrador or another, you know, a cat, for instance. Um, they would only support this being done to somebody of a species um, of being that's been classified as edible. So we can see that carnism is still very much at work. And as vegans, we need to keep holding the spotlight up and making it really clear this is about ideology. This is, this is not... This is not a logical way to be thinking. Mm -hmm. a, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor James McWilliam, says that in some ways it's, it's almost worse, I guess you could say, to kill an animal who wants to stay alive because they're invested in keeping their life. They're happy. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to putting somebody out of their misery who's already suffering so much. Yeah. Um, what would you say, uh, what skills are important for vegan advocates? I think the most important skill, if we're talking about skills for vegan advocates, is to um, is uh, nonviolent communication. Nonviolent communication is a form of communication that is strategic. It's effective. It's designed specifically to increase the likelihood that your message will be heard the way that you intend it to be, and to decrease the likelihood that you will engage in conflict and unproductive and counterproductive conversations. And on my website, carnism.com, my organization is Carnism Awareness and Action Network, and we have a lot of resources for vegans. I have actually one book that I recommend there that I think um, it's called Messages, that I think is a, a very good overview of effective communication strategies. And these strategies can be applied in all life situations, not just when we're talking about veganism, but they're particularly important when we talk about veganism because it's such a difficult and loaded issue for many people to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the emotions make it hard to talk about and carnistic defensiveness makes it difficult too. Yeah. What was your biggest challenge as a vegan advocate? Well, um, years ago, before I was um, really familiar with the issues, what, would be, what was most difficult for me was not being able to respond when people would say things to me that um, I felt I should be responding to. You know, so I would leave a dinner and you know, an hour later say, oh, I should have said that. Oh, I wish I had that answer. You know, when people would say, well, what about plants? Don't plants have feelings too? Or when people would say things that were not particularly respectful of my veganism. I used to just accept it. And um, because I felt like I would look like, you know, if I didn't laugh at jokes people made about me being vegan, I would look like I was too serious and didn't have a sense of humor. But if I did laugh at those jokes, then I would be participating in, you know, disrespecting myself and my ideology, my values. Um, this is one of the things that I talk to vegans about, is, you know, how to recognize carnistic um, prejudice and harassment and some of the things that are directed at us that we don't name as harassment or prejudice because carnism is still so invisible. Um, so, you know, and, and, and most people are doing this unintentionally because they don't, you know, the people doing this, making these jokes, don't recognize the system that is shaping, you know, this kind of dialogue. So becoming informed is really important for vegans. I don't feel that vegans should ever feel like we have to be experts on everything which is what the dominant culture tells us sometimes. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about veganism unless you have all the answers to the problem that's carnism. That's not fair to us, of mm -hmm. course. But it really helps to be informed so that we can be thoughtful and responsive and not caught off guard 
when people are talking to us about these important topics. Okay. Um, yeah, I've already asked this, I think so, but um, yeah, what do you say to people who have like no empathy for animals who say they grew up on a farm and they've seen mm -hmm. everything and they know how everything works? So they're conscious of how people are, of mm -hmm. how animals are treated, but they're not yeah. affected by it. Well, you pick. I mean, there's there's no empathy, and that's a whole other issue. And then there's really diminished empathy or really strong defensive. If somebody is defenses, if somebody is very strongly defended, then it's probably not a good use of our time to be mm -hmm. talking to them about this issue. There are many, many people. For every one person who's that strongly defended, there are hundreds of people who are not. How do we want to use our time and energy? Yeah. Um, what's the bigger why behind what you do? The bigger why behind what I do? That's a really good question. It's probably one that I'll be asking myself in the future. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, the, the bigger why is probably the smaller why. They're probably one and the same. I want to make the world a better place. It makes me feel good to know that I'm contributing something positive to society, and I'm I'm selfish too because that's what makes me feel good. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's reciprocal. Okay. Uh, what or who inspires you? I think I might have answered this already, but yeah. you <laughs> inspire me. <laughs> when I meet groups of people, when I meet people like you who are doing the kinds of things that you're doing, and I hear like you were telling me earlier about the creative ways that you're raising consciousness and helping people live more compassionately. That inspires me. Those are the things that I remember, and those are the things that want me to, to do what I'm doing and to be better at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Who was the first other vegan you've met in your life? The first other vegan I met? Yeah. I, I might have met a lot of vegans and not known they were vegan or remembered they were vegan. I had a friend who was vegan um, who was, for health reasons, she was macrobiotic, and she was the reason I stopped eating dairy, actually, because she was macrobiotic, primarily vegan for health reasons. I was vegetarian for ethical reasons. And she said, but you still eat dairy. And I said, yes. And she said, well, it's really unhealthy, and did you know? And then she told me about the dairy industry. And it still took me a little while to make the change from dairy. But, um, but she said it in a compassionate way. She wasn't judgmental of me. Okay. And I think that that was why I was actually open to hearing what she had to say. Do you have any favorite quotes? Well, I shared probably one of my favorite yeah. quotes with you, the, the Buddhist quote, um, and that's the one I used, I, I'm sorry, that's the one I use probably the most often. I also like the quote, the, en the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. It's a quote that I use a lot when I'm talking to, to vegans, because as vegans we all often feel like we have to be perfect. Um, and, you know, of course we can't be, and um, we can get very frustrated with people who don't become vegan right away as well. And, I think it's important for us to be compassionate and remember that we are animals too, and to practice nonviolence towards self, which means being able to appreciate that we have inherited a very messy world, and all we can do is try to do our best in that world, and sometimes doing our best means just having compassion for ourselves when we are really far from perfect. Okay, last question. What's the best advice or insight you ever got? The best advice that you, the best advice or insight I ever got. I had a guest speaker in my class um, a couple of years ago who was a friend of mine. His name is Jeff Walker, and he said, "The truth is my medicine," and I loved that. And I talked to him about that, and he said that his goal in life, and, and I've adopted this ever since because it really captures the principles I try to live my life by. Live your truth. That's all you can do. Just live your truth. And your truth might change from minute to minute, and your truth might change from day to day. It does. But if you live your truth, you're paying attention to what you're authentically thinking and feeling, what your authentic experience is, and you're responding to it. And it, it helps. When you live your truth, you practice the three C's that I love, that I actually have tattooed on my wrist to remind me. Mm -hmm. um, you practice curiosity, which is an open mind. You practice compassion, which is an open heart. And you practice the courage to be curious and to be compassionate internally and externally to the world. So when I think of living your truth, I think of being curious, compassionate, and courageous as you move through this crazy 
life that we're all trying to move through in the best way we can. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Any plans for the future? I forgot. No, no plans time. for the future. <laughs> um, any plans? I'm really hoping next year to, um, you know, at Carnism Awareness and Action Network, we are launch We just launched our task forces, um, which are organized to their groups of professionals that are coming together to challenge institutionalized carnism um, in the professions. Um, and I am really hoping next year to spend as much time as possible coming to Europe to do more speaking tours because it's a, a very good use of my time and it's very inspiring for me and. Um, it's uh, it's a it's a really great place to be talking about carnism. In the United States is too, but it's it's really it's really time for this to be um, more to have more of an international focus, which is really starting to. Okay. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. And I also have a small gift for you. My oh. own homemade chocolate. I'm so excited. excited, and I'm going to eat yeah. one right now as soon as cool. the camera's <laughs> off, so I don't make a mess on the camera. <laughs>